Hello everyone, Nubkex here. Welcome back to Nub Raids. A couple of weeks ago, I did my Hydra cheat sheet video, which was looking at kind of the, the basics to get down, to get into Hydra, to start making progress on normal, on hard, and then, you know, looking a bit towards those higher difficulties. And that was received really well. So I, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. But what I want to look at today is the advanced side of things, right? For pushing up into Brutal, and more so for pushing up into Nightmare, what are some of the things, the min-max things that you want to do that can have an absolutely huge impact? It's something I've not really touched on all that much before. I've been much more focused on the accessibility side of it, on, on making do with, you know, reasonable requirements. Uh, so this is going to be a very different thing because I feel like I haven't talked about it much before. I just have that bit of a worry that, you know, my audience might not know too much about it. So I said, hey, let's do one video focusing on being a bit more hardcore. I was definitely inspired by Expo Go. Uh, he's one of the newer members of our clan here, but he has an awesome key here. Really cool. 102 million damage on Nightmare. I'm actually going to talk to him and see if we can set up maybe like a showcase of this team or something but it's a team without Crisk and it's just it's very impressive as you guys know I did my Elva Autumnborn showcase a few days ago now and I actually got my record there which was like 92 I don't know 90 something million I think it was 92 million this is a good chunk but beyond that it's better uh, different rotation but still nonetheless it's really cool and it's like what is it that lets him push and do more than what I did because I haven't necessarily built my champions for it. So let's take a look. Right, we're gonna go in and I want to show you, for example, my Royal Guard as an example of this. And I will say the reason as well, I haven't really dived into this too much before is that there's not too much purpose to it right now. I'm kind of at the spot where it's like, I can clear Nightmare Brutal and Hard without too much hassle each week. So it's kind of been a thing that since the Hydra nerf, eh, I don't feel too pushed to really optimize, but I do want to get that knowledge out there. Um, We'll see. I, I'm, I'm really just waiting. I'm in that waiting room myself for Hydra, waiting for the new head that's been on the loading screen for forever, waiting for a new head, a new difficulty, where it's like, then I will be going in and putting this stuff in action. So you can see with my Royal Guard, he's actually in double perception and resilience as random pieces to help reach those sort of stat thresholds. Again, a sort of minimum accessible build. Uh, I actually use him in Brutal mostly, but he'd also, I do use him some rotations in Nightmare. So 230 speed, good speed, tanky enough, 100% crit rate, 222% crit damage, uh, 325 accuracy. You guys know I, I often use Shamrock in the lead, which gives us that extra 70 accuracy. So knocking him up to basically 400, like plenty, uh, as much as you need for Nightmare, even worst case scenario. So um, yeah, that's sort of my Royal Guard. He's built for the stats, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. How much are we losing or how much would we gain if we went in and we can see this is one thing for Expo Go that he has got going on. Relentless, reflex, reflex, relentless, relentless, and then a guardian set, right? What do you gain from that? So I have this little clip here. I'm going to play this and then I'll show you the spreadsheet at the end of it. This is what I did earlier. What I did was I've got, you can see here on the, the left hand side when it comes back, I've got the basic layout of a Royal Guard, how often he's doing his takedown, a big AOE slam. And then I went in and you can see I'm using dice rolls to simulate a run, seeing, you know, will we get the relentless proc every turn? Whenever we use takedown, will we get the refresh proc and all of that? And you can sort of see the methodology going through here and figuring out like how often are we going to get a turn? Are we going to get more relentless? And just seeing how many more in just one sample case, how many more takedowns is that going to add up to? So let's take a look here. And let me show it to you. This is the ultimate spreadsheet I ended up with, which is okay. It's pretty intimidating, but it's okay. You can see with the basic one, it's like takedown every four turns. We're doing a takedown and we got 10 takedowns in total. I'm slightly in the way. Please forgive me. With the refresh, three refresh accessories for 15% and then 18% chance with relentless set to get an extra turn. You can see we got a couple of refresh straight away. We got some relentless procs. I don't feel like this was particularly lucky, but in the end, we walked away with 13. 13 takedowns compared to 10 takedowns. And actually, uh, again, I'm slightly blocking it. If I zoom in, it doesn't want to zoom in. Whoop, zoomed in too much. If we come down to the end, you can see we're actually on the way towards another one much sooner. 
uh, before we analyze this, I also ran it with reflex just to see. You can see with the reflex run, we didn't get any refresh accessories and we actually got extremely lucky. This was a very lucky run where lots of reflex procs. You can see I also put in ones with uh, a strike through because reflex triggering uh, at the start of your turn. If takedown is off cooldown anyway, it wouldn't matter. Uh, though this one actually shouldn't be strike through. This one actually did matter. Um, but for example, this reflex right here, there's nothing to actually cool down. But you can see as it comes through in this one, with very lucky reflex, we actually got 13 as well. So I do think the two sets are fairly comparable. To mention briefly the differences between the two, relentless versus reflex, which one should you use, relentless or reflex? Uh, relentless is going to definitely be better. Oh, I didn't want to open this up. Let's X this off, get rid of it. There we go. <laughs> um, relentless has the advantage obviously you're going to get off more of your other abilities so for example with a champion like royal guard you can use his a3 as well you can get that you know random hitter that can put decreased speed you can get more of those off the relentless proc is it's an extra turn it's going to cycle through both of your cooldowns more quickly so that's a big advantage with a champion like husk right if we go in with our husk husk provoking on his a1 that's crucial to locking down the the head of decay the cleansing head right so those extra turns is giving you more chances it's giving you extra chances to land that provoke and again that adds up you don't get that stuff with reflex right and with reflex you really can't use your other moves like with royal guard if you started to use his a3 your reflex procs could go into the a3 and really mess that up so that's very important right i think that's an important distinction i think overall relentless is better but it's just a very limited set you get this set from winning tournaments and that's very, very hard. <laughs> that's not easy. Whereas Reflex, you can farm from Ice Golem. In terms of, is it worth to farm? What's the difference? To look at this, again, that total of 10 versus 13. That's it. When you think about it, that's a massive increase. If we, again, we leave out the, the bonus of Relentless of extra chances to provoke or extra uses of your other abilities. If we simply look at the takedown damage, which is the big damage, the driving damage, that's 30% more damage. That's a massive amount more damage. It's not a small thing. That is an absolutely huge, huge increase. It's a really big deal. So you add this stuff up and it becomes crazy. We could see, okay, and, and this is not a great example, but oftentimes, you know, it's not unusual for people to be running. Let's look at this one. I think this is a good example. And this team, for example, which is a very, your very standard comp. This is like the... Uh, the old school, this is the classic comp, probably the most common composition throughout all of the history of Hydra for Nightmare difficulty, just across every rotation. Um, and this one with three damage dealers. If you imagine each one of these having 30% more damage, that adds up to a ton. 30%, that's 90% more damage. It's effectively like having a seventh champion in there. It's like having an entire extra damage dealer. This is a huge increase in your total damage if you get them into these sets. Not to mention, of course, that it's not just the total damage that's affected, but when you, you look at this, right, we go back to that spreadsheet, we're having these more frequent takedowns, these more consistent takedowns when it comes to things like breaking free devoured champions it becomes much more consistent. Uh, and that has a big effect, right? That is a, again, a really big deal. Just upping that damage output for breaking champions free, that's a big deal. Killing heads before they get around to their, their next rotation of abilities. Everything like that, it has this much bigger impact. So that's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. I actually got a, an example build. This was from uh, Lowey or Lowey. I actually don't know how to say the name, <laughs> but he's a member of Sin uh, and a very accomplished Hydra player. And he's got really good gear here. But just to give you an example, you look at this Husk, right? And this is what, you know, these end game guys are coming in with. This is a four star awakened Husk, but he's in Relentless. He actually has a speed set as well. But coming in at, what's that, 261 uh, speed? extremely fast got about 241 percent crit damage almost 400 accuracy but coming in with two reflect uh, refresh pieces even a four star look at that four star ring doesn't matter it's worth it the four star ring even the relentless piece and boom this is a husk that could easily be doing probably 50 percent more damage than what my husk is doing which is nuts i do think it's a barrier as well guys right this is definitely a barrier relentless is hard to get um, 
And to get your refresh accessories, you got to get them over here in the bazaar. So we can actually buy them here. We're looking, will we get them? Uh, cleansing amulet, get out of here. And then over here, there we go. Refresh banner, pretty good actually, potentially. But, you know, getting into gold tag arena, that's a big barrier for the five to six star. Uh, but even these four to six stars from being in silver, it adds up and it makes a difference, right? So that's one thing. Huge, a huge difference in terms of optimizing. Absolutely huge. Uh, I, I do think there's a great it, there's great value as well to farming Ice Golem. I think it's one of the better dungeons now. I think Reflex and uh, Provoke there at the bottom are both very good. Yeah, and like all these top sets are pretty bad. Well, Resistance isn't terrible, but you know these top sets are absolutely terrible. But I mean, you compare it to other dungeons. Like I look in Dragon, I look at the sets. Which sets here am I ever going to use out of any of these? Like the only set I might have some use for is speed. And even then I don't have crazy use for it, but I like some, you know, it, it really outshines that over in Fire Knight. Shield's okay, Friend, like, like Regen's done Savage. Fire Knight is definitely better, but Ice Golem's not bad. It's definitely not as bad as people think. I actually, for me, later in the game, value it far more than Dragon. I'm much, much more willing to farm Ice Golem than Dragon. Um, so that's part one, part one. The impact that really focusing on these specific accessories, these specific sets can have on your damage. It's also worthwhile for your supports as well. Again, to go back to Expo Go, we've got the re uh, Relentless on Ugo. We've got the Refresh here on Sigmund. We've got the Relentless on Nekmoth R. This also has a huge impact as well, right? Huge impact. If we look at someone like Ugo, uh, I, I've got my Ugo actually built fairly well. I'm limited on Relentless, but I made sure to put my Ugo, or actually let's look at Pinthroy. I've got Pinthroy in Relentless. So you can see coming in, he's got really low accuracy because he gives himself increased accuracy, but high speed and going in then with that Relentless on, that chance for an extra turn, it lets you cycle through these moves faster, right? Getting back to this heal faster. With Ugo, it's the same deal. Uh, where, which one of my Ugos is fast? I think this one's the faster one. Yeah, so this Ugo again coming in 250 speed, the, the Shamrock supported accuracy level. Uh, we could, I think she actually has an accuracy. No, she's got HP chest, so I could switch that for an accuracy chest and her, she'd still be totally good, right, for, for Nightmare without, um, without Shamrock. But with that Relentless, right, getting those extra turns to make that block buffs more consistent, to make the cleanse more consistent, this is not a small thing. This is a huge thing. So when you see using these sets, don't write it off. The difference is massive. Uh, let's look at a couple other bits. So I wanted to put this in as well. These are more simple, more straightforward, more obvious, but this is something I try to do when building champions if possible. I call this the blight factor, which is trying to just have enough resistance to deal with the head of blight. It's also part of the reason why Geomancer is so good, right? But on Brutal, Blight has 295 accuracy, on Nightmare 330. So you want to have about 100 more resistance, or, you know, more resistance than that. So you can start resisting this stuff. Why is that important? Well, funny enough, when you look ahead of Blight, right, it does a lot of poisons. It actually does a ton of damage, which is really punishing when you're trying to get into Nightmare. Okay, that's fine. At the head of Blight here. Because what happens, because you, you should have good speed control to be going into Nightmare, um, he has, a, he has this um, uh, AOE where he will instantly activate all poisons. That's a move for the cooldown, but he almost never does this move because he'll only do it if there's actually poisons out there for him to explode. If there's no poisons out, he prioritizes his A1. Well, he, he always prioritizes Blinding Smog, right? But he'll go into his A1, which puts out three poisons for two turns. Now, this really adds up. Right, so blinding smog, and then he's gonna do four turns of his A1, because you're gonna be so fast if you do it right. He's almost never gonna do leeching blight. It adds up a lot. Three, five percent poison, so you're gonna take 15% of your max HP per turn, and that can stack up if, if it, potentially, most likely it won't, but every single time blight does an A1, if you don't resist it, you're basically taking 30% of your max HP. So every time he goes through a cycle, right, four of these A1s, it's going to do 120% of your, your HP. And this is poison damage. You can't ignore it. That, that really adds up. It's a lot of healing that you require, which is why I like to, where possible, build enough resistance. And you can see this is where decrease accuracy comes in because you decrease his accuracy by half. 
The resistance requirements actually get quite reasonable when you factor in faction guardians, when you factor in a great hall, right? that building resist, I highly recommend highly that you build resistance in your great hall. For me, I'd build probably accuracy first, resistance second. There, bam, they're the two. And then when I've got all eight of those built up across the, the affinities, then I'll move on to other stuff. But for me, accuracy first, resistance second, crit damage and blah, blah, blah. Forget about it. Accuracy, then resistance, resistance, resistance. Um, you know, you, you factor that stuff in and maybe a couple of pieces of gear with some resistance rolls. It's not outside the realms of possibility to get towards this amount of accuracy. And then you can start resisting it. And you take so much less damage on top of ignoring the provokes, on top of ignoring um, the the decreased attack debuffs, and that's that's not too important. But you know the provokes, the strength, uh, the weakened debuff from head of suffering as well. Being able to resist that stuff is big. Not to mention, of course, having a good chance to resist mischief if he ever does target you. Right, that a different champion. That's also very valuable. So this is something that I would really recommend people to consider as well. On a support champion, if I can, I'm going to try to get them with this amount of resistance. I just think it's really valuable. So let me give you one example here, which would be my Shamrock that I use a lot, right? On my Shamrock, what have I done with him in terms of builds? And it's something that it, this is not a throwaway thing. This is done very intentionally. I've got him with about 415 resistance. So it's a little bit lower than I would like. I'd like it to be a bit higher, but it's kind of tricky. We got him with high speed, high resistance, pretty decent accuracy. Again, we're really relying on that aura. It really carries a lot. Um, but we got him in the Guardian set as well to help protect the team. And this stuff comes together to be quite useful that he doesn't take really much damage at all and it really enables him to tank with Guardian because he's not going to get burned down by these poisons. He's going to be resisting them most of the time just by default. If decreased accuracy goes out, he's resisting them 97% of the time, which is a big deal. It's part of what makes Geomancer a very strong budget option is that obviously we know about the burn. We know about the reflect damage and also the decrease damage is huge. But this A1, that chance 40% for decreased accuracy, up that with Sniper to 45%, this makes a massive, massive difference. Uh, and it's also very helpful on the rotations where Geomancer is a decent affinity versus Head of Blight. That's the Blight factor. This is something that I would really be considering. If you're trying to do Nightmare, you want to be considering this. Uh, speed is also a big thing. Just to, I, I, I've, I cover this in the basic. This is much more basic, this bit, but just to illustrate it, I think it's interesting. If you look at the Head of Decay, okay, on Brutal, 210 speed, on Nightmare, 220. When you put decrease speed on, reduce that by 30%, he goes down to 147 speed and goes from 220 to 154. That's a big difference. And then if I'm building champions, let's say 250 speed, which is, you know, for this end game min-maxing, that's kind of the, the benchmark of what you want. And you put increased speed on, your speed actually jumps up to like 325. It's a pretty big deal. If you factor in a speed aura, which you might use, it gets obviously even stronger than that. But let's say, just keep it like this for now. Well, this becomes a big difference. So if we have no speed manipulation, right? If we're going in with no increase speed, no decrease speed, it's 210 versus 250. We're 119% of the speed of, of the head of decay, right? Not that big of a difference. If we put on decrease speed and we put on increase speed, it jumps up to we're 221% the speed of the head of decay. That's massive. It's like you're getting almost twice as many turns versus the turns the Hydra head are taking with increase speed, decrease speed. I just wanted to illustrate that, that you, you put the minus 30% is, is a bigger effect, I would say, but obviously harder, somewhat harder to maintain. You, you put the plus 30% on you, it actually adds up to a huge difference. On Nightmare, you go from 114% of the speed, relative speed, to 211%. Massive difference, really big difference. And then finally, I wanted to mention the Crisk factor. I thought, again, this was actually really interesting. This idea that you need Crisk is not true, but Crisk actually really, really helps. Like, again, going back to Expo Go here, I thought this team was so fun because he's got Sigmund in there. Hey, you know, people always constantly shit on Sigmund. They they really don't appreciate him. Uh, I've tried to highlight him in a few of my videos for sure. Great champion. I definitely use him. Um, but I thought this is so impressive to see him come in on a 100 million damage team. It's so, so impressive. 
Uh, but Sigmund comes in and he's very cool. He brings a provoke like Krisk does. He brings decrease attack, although Nekmothar also does. But, you know, the different affinities gives it a bit more coverage, but brings in a provoke. He's got some buff stripping stuff. And then the strength and then the shield. It's not as good as Krisk, but it's still pretty damn good. It's pretty solid. Uh, and the thing I wanted to highlight here is in terms of surviving damage, right? Because, let, let me jump across, that we're jumping around a bit. If we look at this super high-end husk, what do we see when we look at him? 46,000 HP, about 1,900 defense, right? This is a really, really, really squishy husk. This is not a tanky husk at all. How are we getting away with this? Well, it's just the effect of, of a couple of buffs and debuffs. So with Krisk, when a Hydra Head actually smacks you, right? It's doing 100% damage just by default. You put on decrease attack, you half that damage. Ally protection then from Krisk, ally protection is 50% of the damage goes to, to Krisk in this case, reduces it by another half, 25% of the damage. And this is how you can have these champions actually be pretty squishy and still manage to stand up in Nightmare. And while you can see like Nightmare teams that are actually fairly squishy champions being super survivable, and then you see like, you know, on a newer player's account, you might see them on normal being absolutely battered around the place. How's that going on? The stats on normal are so much lower. Why are they being battered around so much? Whereas on Nightmare, they're making it through. Part of it is all that speed control that you're staying so far ahead. You're so much in control. And then the other part is like, you're taking one quarter of the damage if you've got decreased attack ally protection. At Chris obviously brings both. In the case of Sigmund, decrease attack he brings that with strengthen it's actually 37.5 percent yeah it's rounding it up for some reason it's being rude i don't know why i don't understand spreadsheets i don't have any actual skills what are we talking about here um but yeah 37.5 percent. so it's not as good but it's still strong and then you factor in the shield as well and it starts to add up to a lot right it starts to add up to a lot and you can look at other champions that can come in and do this too I think a great champion is this new one. I'm really big on her after YST showcased her Nia coming in with a small strength and an ally protection. AOE decrease, it's actually Krisk's A1. AOE decrease speed, void affinity, so that's nice. And then a really, really cool A2 where you can reset the cooldown of a target skill. So that's a big deal, really big deal. Um, so yeah, you put that you put that together as well and suddenly you become survivable. So that's, a, that's fairly, ba that's basic stuff, right? That's basic. But it just to illustrate how much of a difference these things can make, right? I think the big one, the big one that I have not done, obviously, is is the sets. And that can make, again, potentially like a 30% damage increase, roughly, on average. From the two sample cases I did, we got 30% more damage in both of them, which is absolutely nuts. That's massive. That is massive. This is something I do do, really considering resistance decrease accuracy buffs out there as well as a way to massively mitigate damage. It's not important on, you know, it's not important on every champion, um, but it's something that's really worthwhile on your supports. This is how to make your supports tankier, right? It's how to make an Inquisitor Shamel survive when he's in Guardian. He's going to be super tanky if he doesn't take those poisons. He's just not going to get hit that hard. It's just how to make your team tanky. That resistance makes a huge deal. The decrease accuracy. So yeah, this is hopefully being interesting. You consider the speed, the crisp factor in terms of building your team to be survivable and how that can let you build these bigger sets. Hopefully it's an insight into how the heck do people put out these crazy numbers on these higher difficulties. That's really part of the key of it. That's a big part of the key of it. Um, and just again, for anyone that was interested in getting into that mindset of min-maxing the Hydra, right? And starting to think about, okay, what sort of steps do I need to take to really get the most out of this as possible? Like these are the sort of things and I, I haven't really drawn attention to it too much before. So I thought it'd be good to do. So there you go, guys. Hopefully you found it an interesting discussion. Like I said, I'll try to talk to Expo and and see if we can get a showcase of this team up. because I think it's it's a really, really cool team. Um, might talk to Face as well. Again, another Chrysalis team with Nekmothar, of course, coming in, which is really nice. Uh, with the Skull Lord instead. Um, yeah, you get the gist. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.